Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next speaker series with the uh, Nystrand Center of Excellence in Education. We appreciate you joining us, as always. Um, we, uh, we're we're going to get started with our discussion and our presentation uh, this afternoon in just a moment. Um, it's a, a pleasure to meet you all. My name is Brandon Gossett. I am with the Nystrand Center. Um, and uh, as we get kicked off tonight, we're, our session tonight is titled uh, Equity Centered Leadership, and we're going to be welcoming Dr. John Marshall from uh, J, uh, JCPS. If you're not uh, from around these parts, JCPS is Jefferson County Public School, uh, the public school system here in the Louisville area. So we're uh, excited to, to welcome Dr. Marshall tonight or this afternoon. Uh, and look forward to the conversation. Uh, before we get started, I would like to introduce you to our director here in the Nystrand Center, Dr. Geneva Stark. Uh, she will be facilitating the conversation today. Uh, and again, Dr. Stark is the director here in our center. Um, she is, uh, in addition to being the center director, she's also a clinical professor um, in the College of Education and Human Development, uh, specifically in the Education Leadership Evaluation and Organization Department. We simply call it the, the ELIAD Department around here. Uh, Dr. Stark is a servant leader, a visionary, educator, achiever, collaborator, and a problem solver. Uh, she's a native of New Orleans, Louisiana. I've been practicing on that, Dr. Stark. Make sure I pronounce that right. Uh, and of course, resides here in Metro Louisville. Uh, she received her BS degree from Xavier University there in New Orleans and her master's in education from the University of New Orleans. Uh, and she received her doctor of philosophy from the university from with us here at the University of Louisville. Uh, she's also a national professional certification in diversity and inclusion. Uh, if Dr. Stark is familiar to you, if she looks familiar, it might be because she retired from JCPS after 25 years of administrative service there, uh, where she was a teacher, assistant principal, and, uh, and then principal at Western High School. Uh, she became the first and only African-American to serve as president of Kentucky Association of Secondary School Principals. Uh, later, she moved to JCPS Human Resources, where she served in a variety of roles. Uh, she's also served as district administrator in diversity, equity, and poverty department. So again, very uh, relevant background for our conversations to, uh, today, especially. Uh, she's one of four educators recently selected to participate in the Minority Superintendent Fellowship Program. Uh, she's worked collaboratively with various departments on professional development for uh, JC, or excuse me, Jefferson County Public uh, regarding public schools regarding racial equity policy and implicit bias. She's actively involved in local, regional, and national organizations that are dedicated to diversity, equity, inclusion, inclusion, and sense of belonging. And she serves as diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant at local, state, national, and international levels. And if that's not enough, she serves as the treasurer on the board of directors of the National Alliance of Black School Educators. And she's also a member of the Louisville League of Women Voters and the National, Co national Council of Negro Women. Um, she serves as a mentor to students, teachers, and supports staff and administrators uh, at all levels, and um, very fortunate to have her with us today um, and, uh, and facilitating our conversation. So with that, Dr. Stark, I will turn it over to you. Hey, thank you, Brandon, and thank you for the introduction. But also thank you to those who are joining us today. Again, uh, this is the Nice Trans Center Speaker Series, and um, this is the fifth installment of the 20 to 23 school year. And today we have the honor of having Dr. John Marshall, the Chief Equity Officer for Jefferson County Public Schools. Not only is he the Chief Equity Officer of Jefferson County Public Schools, but he's also one of the prominent K-12 equity-centered leaders in this country. Dr. Marshall has been featured in Ed Week. He's an author, you know, and he's done so many things that regarding equity inclusion, and unapologetic for that. But I'm going to let Dr. Marshall continue to introduce himself and some of the things that he has done and accomplished and wants to do and still continues to do because the work is not done. 
And so with that, Dr. Marshall, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you. And then we're going to do a Q&A. Dr. Marshall. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is John Marshall. I'm a Louisville native, uh, born and raised, and very proud to be a Louisville native. I want to first say that every school I went to has deemed was deemed failing or low performing. Now, why am I saying that? Because I don't believe there's such thing as a low performing building. Besides the fact, unless we believe in personifying buildings, buildings can't teach. I believe there's some low performing spokes in the wheel, but it has nothing to do with brick and mortar. It has everything to do with minds, hearts, and belief in students. And to be even more clear, a lot of it has to do with adult beliefs, part one. Part two, as I discuss curriculum or answer questions around curriculum, I want to remind us as educators and leaders, there's a schoolhouse curriculum and there's a curriculum of America. The American curriculum is what we also must address. Me dedicating my life to education, I want to address the whitewashed hegemonic curriculum that's in public school. But however, the curriculum of the bank is just as racist. The curriculum of uh, real estate is just as racist. The curriculum of big business is just as racist. So there is an American curriculum that we all must be honest about and address as well. But I have dedicated my life to understanding that this thing called curriculum violence and this thing called curriculum exclusion is also by design. And as the chief equity officer and any chief equity officer worth his or her salt must stay faithful to understanding that their main job is not to report out on HR, not to talk about how bad black and brown kids are doing, but to address a system that's doing exactly what it is designed to do. Um, and I am dedicated to doing that unapologetically. Um, and I have no problems in talking about the things that we must talk about. So I'm honored to be here. Uh, we could still be giving introductions on this great lady called Geneva Stark, because she too is unapologetic in the work. Her and I have traversed areas of this country and gave people the business and what for, unapologetic. And we're going to continue to do that kind of work as we build more allies and start telling the truth about public schools. I end with just saying, I still believe that public schools is, the, is, a, save, is a saving grace to what America will become, or public schools will be a contributing factor to the decline that we're already facing and will continue to face if we don't get it right. Uh, Dr. Stark, do you want me to talk or you want to just jump into questions? Okay. I can, you know um, me, I can ramble for, I can do hey, whatever. You know, hey, we both can. Um, but I guess what I can also um, start off with the, um, as the Chief Equity Officer of Diversity, Equity, and Poverty, it's been 10 plus years already, you know, <laughs> and, um, you know, you, talk, you started in 2012 and now it's 2023. And so I remember that the problem was five people. Now it's a number of people. So I want you to just talk about the expansion of the diversity, equity, and poverty department, because as we both realize, if it's a department of one, you're basically checking a box. So speak about the, the growth and expansion of the diversity, equity, and poverty department um, under your leadership that touches lives every day. So sure, um, started off with four or five, now collectively, it's 46 to 53, depending on if you want to count those that aren't getting paid but volunteering. Um, one of the things in JCPS that I am very proud of is that expansion. Uh, some of my team is on here. I will not ask them to speak, but they can definitely introduce themselves in the chat if they're willing. Um, but it is that expansion that makes a loud statement, right? Like, and the other thing about this expansion is I hired people that are about the action of racial equity and, and ed educational equity. How do we go from four to 56? The use of data, right? The use of data says that we need to have a department and a district that is dedicated to equity. Data says, data are clear, that if we're going to address some of the disproportionate outcomes of students, we need a department that wakes up and addresses that. Also, the tenacity in which we have to have this kind of department um, is, is unmatched. Uh, there's a reason why a lot of urban districts don't have a department like mine. And I will go on record to say I have the best uh, diversity, equity, include whatever you want to call it, department in the nation. The majority of the people on this call that are uh, reporting to me can lead urban districts as a superintendent or a chief equity officer today. But you get there by actually calling elected officials 
and asking them or calling out elected officials, board included, and saying, we keep saying we need to do this. We keep saying it's important. Then why is there only three of me to address a district that has over 90,000 students? Why is there only this penny's amount of uh, uh, equitable funds or liquidated funds that I can use to move this work? And how do we systematize that? But the growth comes from tenacious leadership. I first started with Superintendent Dr. Hargens. Now I work uh, directly, uh, I report directly to um, Dr. Marty Polio. I will also say this, and I don't know who's listening. If you are an equity officer in central office, your best position is reporting directly to the superintendent so you can manage up. And why that is important, because as of right now, most superintendents did not go through the track of equity. So they're going to need some help as well in managing up. Now, most superintendents do understand educational equity to a degree, but you must be very comfortable and confident and say, in this, in this field right here, just like the chief financial officer knows exactly what he or she's talking about, I am that person. I am the one that knows what I'm talking about. I am the one that's most researched. I'm the one that's most confident in speaking to it. And I am the one that can help you address the inequities in the district. So our expansion came with tenacity. Our expansion came with bringing the data. Our expansion came with holding people accountable for the promises and interests that they claim they have. And then you end up with the great team, like I said, some that are on here, and um, you start making, you start moving the work. And you definitely want to hire agitators, but you definitely want to have uh, higher intellects. And you also want to hire people that are impatient. Thank you very much for that. And um, as we talk about um, the work in, in your department and, um, and what has been done in the expansion, and, and you had the opportunity and the wherewithal and the, and the courage to come up with a racial equity policy when people across the country or even here locally said, you know, don't say racial yeah. equity, right. just say equity. So speak to the courage and the leadership and, the, and, and, and what you carried with you to be able to get to that point. Sure. So most districts now are popping up these equity policies. And if we're gonna be honest, they're very vanilla, no pun intended and very um, soft. Uh, we wanted to put the R word in front of it because data again are clear. Uh, we have a racial equity problem. We have a race problem, put the ism on it. We have a system that is absolutely historically tried and true proven to be designed for one group of people. And it's not people that look like myself and Dr. Stark. So we also understand with the historic um, and constant and consistent number um, data presentations we have around this thing called the achievement gap, around this thing called disproportionality and suspension, around this thing called a, calling needing to hire minority teachers, we have a race problem. And a race problem must be addressed through policy. Again, policy, when done right, doesn't really care about feelings once it gets put in place. If it's in policy, it's an expectation. If it's in policy, it kind of cuts across party affiliations. It kind of cuts across even theoretical beliefs to some degree. The policy says you are to do this. So it gives us teeth in theory because we don't have everybody on board doing this work. And the enforcing of racial equity policy in the 2023 um, uh, system that's uh, over 400 years old, but in 2023 is still very difficult. But the policy is hard in the sense that Nobody wants to talk about race still. We have a thousand books out now about courageous conversations. We have a lot of people that are saying we need to talk about race, but we don't have a lot of people actually doing something past the talk. And if you get past the talk, it comes time to action. So again, if there's something you, I would love for you to take from me is reporting out is not accountability. Reading a book is not accountability. Going to a PD is not accountability. It must be action in response to your report out. There must be action in response to your professional development. It must be action in response to how you change and rearrange your lesson plan. Um, so that's kind of why the racial equity policy is important. Every district's gonna have an equity policy. And even before equity policies were in vogue and trendy in name brand, every district had a, a mission statement that said they're gonna be fair and equitable. We know that's a lie because the data says different. So if we're going to be serious about it, especially in any urban district, Maine to Hawaii, Race has to be at the foci of this work, um, period. There are other inequities that we must address and we do not shy away from them. We address that with all fervor. 
But we believe here in Jefferson County Public Schools that once we address race, uh, other ships in the ocean will rise as well. And, and you're absolutely right, because when you start talking about data, um, it's easy to get lost when we just say equity. But when you have to disaggregate the data to break it down to look at the specific individuals or specific role groups, you know, in those in that, in those particular areas, and you've been able to do that. Um, and aside from the, just talk about some of the challenges, you know, that you encountered um, in trying to implement the racial equity policy, because um, again, it's a heavy lift. Uh, I know some people have, um, have have had death threats, you know, people working in the parking lot and all of those things coming, but just doing the right thing, you know. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you have to encounter to get this policy passed from um, so-called friends, colleagues, or just, um, you know, people that, um, the ch some of your challenges and some of the, maybe the, the threats that you've had to encounter as a result of the work that you um, that you live by, that, you, that you're very passionate about. Sure. So I will start first with the negative and then with the positive. Cowardly Black people and people of color mm -hmm. and angry white people that don't believe that anything is wrong and then, everybody, and then those with blinders. Um, one of the things you really realize when you start doing this work is there's, there's different factions of people that um, engage with this work, right? There's some that look to myself and my team as really we're doing gladiatorial work and we're on a mission and they appreciate it and they are shoulder to shoulder with us with no mask on, no whispering, no guessing. If it's time to really get into this work, they're with us. There's others that are with us, but will only come to you after you give a keynote, after you do an op-ed, after my team does a PD and whisper, man, I'm so glad y'all are doing this. And then there's others that are absolutely too scared to do anything. Mm -hmm. And then there are those that will cut you at the knees and act like they're doing something and not doing anything. I have encountered all of that. On the other end, yes, threats all the time. I'm writing a book called Meet Me Outside, or I bet you, I dare you to. And I'm responding to some of these emails when I retire because they are absolutely as egregious as something you had heard in the early 1900s. And, um, uh, anywhere around black people and, and um, education. Um, some of the other things we've heard is, I mean, you've seen is post-its on my car. Uh, my daughters, three of them, who have been addressed or uh, uh, approached by uh, students of um, parents that work in JCPS that aren't in favor of some of the work. And then some of the other things you encounter is just always challenging your intellect, which I always love a good, um, uh, cognitive uh, sparring match because I like again I uh, just as much as Kobe stayed on the court I stay in the books and research so I always welcome that but you always have to be prepared for that and I in I, and on your question Dr. Stark I want to remind us that education is being politically captured and it's being um, absolutely positively um, used to promote an anti-intellectual desire if if we stay uninformed if we stay um, unlearned, if you will, to what really happened in American history or to what could happen if we repeat it and we don't teach in a way that reaches uh, students, there is a group of people that will benefit from that. But this achievement gap that we profess to Claire about does not happen. So the violence or the threats of violence, I, I ain't really experienced no kind of violence physically, um, but the, the threats of violence is always present. I will tell you also as an equity officer, and I'm, I can make some assumptions on a difference, and probably even more so if you are a woman of color. The hard part about being an equity officer and being black is there is no cutoff switch. You wake up and address inequities in the system. You walk out your house and are worried about the inequities that could have you killed, pulled over, shot, fired, anything. So there is no off switch. So that is probably the most taxing part of this work. And an HR, a chief of HR can cut it off because you're not always trying to do something. But if you are in a system and you're hired to address a system that, has all, that is against you, and now I'm talking about the American curriculum, not just school curriculum, there is no off switch. So if you don't have prayer, if that's your thing, if you don't have exercise, if that's your thing, if you don't have soldiers like my team um, and you don't have a support staff, that it is even more taxing. If you don't have someone that you can uh, share some of the crazy, ignorant, poorly written threats, and um, laugh them off or address them, 
then it's even harder. But I, I would say that that is probably one of the hardest parts of this work. Mm -hmm. But I challenge any equity officer that's not getting them, they're probably not doing anything. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're absolutely right because um, there are many of them who have walked away and you have many of them who have just, or check, you know, just decide to check a box. And so they are basically um, holding, a, uh, holding a seat and, and not really being at the table and don't really want to be at the table, but it is heavy lifting work but it's, it's work that's it's necessary work, you know, as well. And uh, I could tell you that, you know, as I do the consulting work, you have people that say, hey, Dr. Salk, I hear you, but I'm afraid to do my job. I'm afraid because someone may be outside the door, a parent may give me a call, or I don't have an administration that's, that's strong enough to deal with what's happening in our country today. And so <clears throat> what do we say to these, uh, these individuals? Because there are statutes in place you know, in curriculum and place core content guidelines that you have to follow right. as an educator. Right. Yeah. So there's two things, and I don't mean this cavalier at all, because Lord knows I'm going to have three daughters storming in this house in a minute, stomach sounding like lions needing to be fed. Mm -hmm. But you can't do this job if you're scared to lose your job. Mm -hmm. You cannot do this job if you're scared to lose your job, if you really want to make a change. So I go back to the things you have to rely on to make it through. If you have a higher power, you need to believe in that. If you have faith in whatever you wanna call it, believe in that. If you have a support staff that won't let your babies go starving, believe in that. But to your, uh, also to your point, we also need to understand that the American curriculum has created, has made teachers that want to teach accurate curriculum outlaws. There are teachers that are working under the threat of being financially and publicly hanged if they teach correct. Not if they teach something crazy, but if they say, well, what if we start discussing Thomas Jefferson as a pedophile? Literally can get fired for saying, let's discuss this other part of Thomas Jefferson. I have a colleague on here, Rachel Klein, who has problematized the play, the musical that we love, Hamilton. Not problematizing the play, but the people in which that are in it and really saying, how about we teach this way? So there is just a level of courage and there is a level of unsatisfaction and a level of um, this could be it uh, every day. And I'm not saying that to be brave because I want to tell you something else. I don't want people to think I'm not scared. I'm just not uh, paralyzed. Mm -hmm. I, I am very scared of the violence and the propensity that people have shown towards progress. I am very scared of that. I am very proud of my skin. I am very scared of the fact that people are scared of my skin. Mm -hmm. And I still try to find some ways to move this work forward and maybe make it a difference for my grandchildren because my kids went through the same JCPS I went through. Absolutely. Are going, are going through the same JCPS. One's a freshman, one's a senior. So there's very little that has changed, but maybe uh, when I have grandkids and I'm a pop-pop, pop-pop will say, you know, this is a different JCPS. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a different community, you know, yeah. so to speak, you know, and um, because as JCPS goes, so does the community, you know, or vice versa, you know. With the racial equity policy, there's an instrument that you use, that's used to drive that or to make sure that the system is not marginalizing a particular group. Can you speak to the, the racial equity analysis protocol? Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, and, and shout out to uh, one of my um, partners in war, uh, Vanessa McPhail. I don't know if she's on here, I think she might be. Dr. Vanessa McPhail, she's kind of the, um, the guru, manager, and owner of the REAPS. We call it the REAP, Racial Equity Analysis Protocol. And in a nutshell, what it is, is it's, in, in, uh, it's questions that make you introspect the way in which you practice and believe, uh, uh, the way in which you practice and want to input policies uh, throughout your school. For example, at Stark Pittman High School, she wants to create a policy that says you can't wear hair lower than your collar for boys. And then you have these questions that you ask. One of the most, the, the, probably the most potent question in there is, what race would this marginalize or, dispro or disproportionately impact if you enact this policy? And if you say it is black students, if you say it is brown students, if you say it is black girls, you are strongly encouraged and expected to stop and not do it. I'm giving one that's very obvious. 
but one that uh, Dr. McPhail still runs into is uh, come winter time, should you bring in 10 cans, uh, 10 cans to give away, you don't have to um, take this final. But then when you start asking those questions and you start saying, I'm at a school that's 98% uh, free and reduced lunch, 87% black, and I'm asking these students to bring in food to give away and they might not have it. You then start pivoting on your practices. You then start thinking through what it is I'm doing. So the racial equity analysis protocol is something that Dr. Polio has said every principal must do and must challenge their practices to make sure it is not intentionally or unintentionally marginalizing, muting, or mistreating black students. And again, um, I don't have it in front of me, but if anybody on my team can get it, they can slam it in this chat right now. And Dr. Stark, I'm tripping, you have it too, but uh, <laughs> we can slam it in this, we can slam it in this chat if any of my team is readily available and compelled to do so. Mm -hmm. But it is a very powerful tool. Uh, and it has actually, again, Dr. Stark, myself, we've taken it from Maine to Hawaii and people are using it and kind of changing it around for their own district to make it work. Yeah, and as you um, state that, you know, how many districts across the country have you been able to help and assist? Or can you even count the numbers that's just, yeah. they're just looking for guidance and direction? So I'll, I'll be honest. I'll, I'll, been well over 50, 60 districts, but a lot of times they want me to come talk and that's where it ends. So they want to check off. They had a black equity officer come talk and not do anything else. But there are districts that actually start moving the work forward and they are very, progr uh, not progressive, they are very brave and progressive in moving the work. So the amount of places I've been to help is um, getting almost hard to count, whether it's via Zoom or actually traveling there. But again, a lot of districts um, are still saying, well, let's get John to talk. Let's get John to come say what he's going to say and clap for him and all this stuff. But then when I circle back around a year later, well, we just haven't figured out how to get implicit bias off the ground. Or, well, now legislation says we can't teach this, that, or this. So there's a whole bunch of things that come into play, but it has been, um, it's been a whirlwind and it's been a joy because I thought I was going to be a classroom teacher for life. Um, and here I am doing this work, and it is a, um, it's the same battlefield, but I'm in a different platoon, if you will. Yeah. And needed and necessary work, and as you stated about um, legislation, um, I recently did a, um, a session on equity curriculum, why legislators so resistant, wow. um, and during the pandemic, the first year, people loved educators, because yeah parents had to be home with their children. <laughs> yeah. And then, and also the, the protests of Breonna Taylor and um, George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey came about. And <clears> as <throat> people began to see the protesters, the protesters were not just black people. They were people of all <clears throat> persuasions. And that in itself, people got alarmed and said, oh my God, they are woke. It wasn't that they awoke. America had to stop and pause and was able to see Chauvin sit on the neck of George Floyd for nine minutes and 46 seconds. Yeah. Right. And, and then they came with, that's when they came with the 1619, you know, the critical race theory and all of the stuff with that. And now there were five states that had legislation that enacted legislation quickly against CRT and, um, and diversity, equity, and training in terms of even though the whole government was shut down. If you receive money and funding, they shut yep. down the government, you know, the military, anyone that was receiving federal funds had to basically stop and pause. And, and, and so that and self, so now that legislation is in place, how do we combat that? Because now we have, instead of five states, now we have like 40 some states, 40 plus states that's trying to put in legislation. And, you know, and as a result of that, there's a mass exit of, of educators leaving education system. Right. So this is a Johnism, and I, I don't know how we combat said legislation other than keep agitating, keep speaking against it. Um, we literally are creating, not we, America itself is literally creating an educational underground railroad. And we need to be educational emancipationists. And we need to be very clear on what line we stand on, right? And that requires individual uh, checking ourselves and waking up and saying, what are you going to do uh, as relates to this legislation and how are you going to work with it? 
Can you be culturally responsive and not teach 16, 19? Sure. Can you be culturally responsive and talk about the uh, assumed contributions of the, the white forefathers? Maybe. But can you be uh, comfortable with yourself knowing that you're teaching homogenized whitened curriculum is something else that you have to deal with. So as legislation spreads and this contagion of anti-intellectual, anti-Black uh, stuff keeps going, there's a true line of demarcation that I think we all must say, almost take, and it doesn't have to be always announced. Um, it has to be this, just this decision. I mean, a lot of us don't like Huckleberry Finn, but one of my favorite moments in that book or in that novel is when the little, when Huck says, if going to hell is where I'm headed for saving the slave, then I'm gonna go to hell. So um, we need to be ready to tear up a letter and say, in spite of this, this is what we need to do because our children our children really need it. But in the, in the end, and also what we need to do is design curriculum that is affirming and correct. So I think that's gonna be an individual thing. I don't see it stopping. I understand that anti-intellectualism is big business. The dumber we are, the rich, the uh, the more rich the dumb people get. The mm -hmm. the dumb rich people get richer. But the dumber we are, and the least we know about ourselves, and the least others know about themselves, is something that we must address. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Jones says all the time, the way American curriculum is now, Dr. Stark, it gives white people a superiority complex, and it gives everybody else an inferiority complex. And we just got to decide on if we're comfortable with that or not. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not comfortable with that raising three black girls. I'm not comfortable with that still being pissed off when I'm sitting there watching this movie and I realized there was black women that got those white men to the moon and there wasn't a peep in there. I'm not comfortable with white people, some white people being frustrated with why the black community doesn't get the vaccination because they were never taught about the science and experiments they've done on black people. And that is by design. So there's a whole lot that we need to do and legislation is putting us in a place where they clearly believe in anti-intellectualism. I mean, we, we actually have people running for the most powerful position in the world and they are just dumb as they can be. But anti-intellectualism is actually big business and it will continue to be big business until we end that business. And, and I say, I contend that our educational system has been hijacked, you know, and in the worst way. And um, yes, we knew before that, Everything wasn't what it needed to be or should have been, but right now, within the last two or three years, with the legislation and everything that's going on, uh, it has been hijacked, and the, it's the small voices that would allow this. So the question becomes: What do we? What are we going to do about it? Because I believe that we all can do something in the spaces and places that we occupy. You know, mm -hmm. what is your intestinal fortitude? What are you going to do about it? And again, as you said, it has to go beyond just conversation. It has to go beyond just yeah. a meeting to meet. Um, we have to look at putting policies in place to be yeah. able to do the work, you know. Um, and, just you said, to, and I agree with that. And I, I, you know, I'm always with you. I'm starting to think, and I put this to the group. I don't. We always say it's the small voices that get heard. I think it's a whole lot of voices. All I'm just ain't talking. Mm. I mean, just go to the polls. I mean, people are voting for fools. They ain't, they ain't out there chapping and saying, I can't stand black people. Let's put them back in slavery. But obviously that's what they feel or else we wouldn't be where we are. Mm -hmm. So there is a group of people speaking, but those cowards that are camouflaged and support that are in mass. And that is the American curriculum that's the most scary. I am not scared of the outward racist or sexist. I'm not scared of that person. That doesn't scare me. What scares me is these cowards that um, maybe even on this call or that are in JCPS or that are my neighbor or that uh, wears a police uniform that believes all this stuff, but doesn't do it, but doesn't speak it, but acts on it, which is way worse anyway. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You, you just um, um, cited an article in the Courier Journal about editing curriculum. Yeah. Uh, speak to that and um, yeah, because it, it's, uh, it's massive right now. And even so much so you have um, DeSantis in, um, in Florida, the Florida governor, that says um, AP curriculum for African Americans is is um, is nothing void. is is not important. So right. speak to that editing curriculum, and how do we get beyond that? Sure. So as you know, they um, the advanced program board, who if you look at their mission statement, actually has nerve to say that they want to be about equity. 
has taken out um, certain provocateurs and certain people that do not um, reflect the traditional beliefs about America and or life, lifestyle choices, orientation, et cetera. Uh, the op-ed actually speaks to um, how anti-intellectualism, which is what I've been talking about, is really fortified in public school and how much of a betrayal something like the advanced place of uh, the um, advanced program, advanced placement board to remove a bell hooks from Hopkinsville, Kentucky um, and how dangerous that is. Those are very strong statements. Now they're saying that it still didn't weaken or bleach their curriculum, but it did not get removed until the, the few, back to what you're saying, the, the, the voices of the few got loud enough to have the advanced placement board remove them. So why put them in if you're gonna remove them? So the, the op-ed, which also struck some people's nerves and had people mad, the op-ed challenges that, and it talks about this notion of who we pick to teach, right? Bell Hooks has a thing, uh, she has a quote that says, I'd rather die than not be who I am. And we take her out. But we all learned that Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. They're saying the exact same thing. Why are we heroizing this white boy and taking away uh, the voice of this very, very progressive, very, very provocative uh, sister who actually has something to say and who we know in the urban core could be more engaging. But again, Patrick Henry, superhero, give me liberty or give me death, bell hooks, I'd rather die than be this, this or that is uh, a pirate and a problem. So we have to really challenge how that, you know, what that really means when we say those kind of statements mm -hmm. and what is being taught by not teaching anything, because we got to remember too, we're still teaching when we don't teach. Yeah. We're just teaching something that people don't want to own. And we're teaching that there's a group that doesn't deserve, doesn't belong, and is not wanted. And we're teaching a group that you deserve everything, even though um, you have not. Lastly, uh, Geneva, I always talk about unearned elitism. Public schools and education in and of itself creates an unearned elite class of people that are by no way more, more intelligent, no way more deserving, in no way more um, or should not be propped up any more than anyone else. But we create these elite systems in this track and this is how we end up where we are. Absolutely. Um, and as we talk about that and you know, making a difference and where we are in different things, um, I wanna shift to um, the Louisville Teacher Residency Program um, that was mm -hmm. um, birthed here in Jefferson County and yeah. DEP. And so, because um, many people don't know that uh, the it was birthed in the Diversity, Equity, and Poverty Department at Jefferson County Public Schools. Right. So the Louisville Teacher Residence Program in partnership with the University of Louisville. And the rationale uh, for it, yeah. <laughs> under the leadership of uh, Selena Fishback. It is a program where we are taking um, adults that already have a degree, but want to come back into teaching and putting them on an accelerated track to become certified teachers, paid as teachers, while they learn as they go. It is very, very rigorous. And unapologetically, it is predominantly, um, the each group, each cohort is predominantly people, uh, teachers of color. The reason why I like the program is A, we're paying them accordingly, but B, it um, puts us in a position to work closely with the mother institution of the city U of L and put them in a place to get culturally responsive teaching all the while learning on the fly. To some degrees, I say it gives them a hair of a step ahead of those that go the traditional track because it's on, it's on the job learning instantly. I, I took two years in education classes before I even set foot in a the classroom. These teachers are in the classroom day one, seeing how John and Brandon and Patricia really act and what we need to think about it. So it is a very, very promising program. Dr. Polio, right now we have, I think, 50 in this cohort. He wants 100 per cohort, and he wants it to stay predominantly teachers of color. It is um, a national model. Uh, started with Dr. Horton, who is now a superintendent in Wheaton, or somewhere in Illinois, mm -hmm. um, and led here by um, Dr. S or Ms. Selena Fishback in diversity, equity, and poverty. Very potent and could not do this with that without UofL. But again, the strength is it's about culturally responsive teaching and culturally responsive leadership. 
Thank you very much. And and other programs, uh, I know there's a number of programs because as we talked about that, we've gone from from five individuals um, in DEP to you know forty plus. Yeah, can you just highlight just some of the programs that because what happens all too often is that you have people in the community that says, oh well, they should be doing this or someone in higher ed said so they should be doing this, but things mm -hmm. are being done, but no one knows what those things are. So. Mm -hmm. Just highlight just some of the programs that you know that you know, that's happening, yeah, you know, under the diversity, equity, and poverty. You know, where you even like during during the breaks, you know, there's programs for to engage students. All those things that people don't know, don't hear about. Um, but just speak to that for a few minutes. Sure. And as I speak, and I can't see the chat. I don't even know if my team has access to do it. Mm -hmm. We have a thing called the DEP Vita. Mm -hmm. Um, where it actually lists all the things we're doing. But uh, we have a program called Literacy In, again, led by Dr. Vanessa Fell, mm -hmm. uh, where literacy and an activity are merged. And it is used to actually help with comprehension and understanding and phonemic awareness and all things literacy. But what you do is take a culturally responsive content or context of a book and connect it to the thing of the book. So we have something called Lit in Karate. We find a book that is engaging and culturally responsive with the characters being of color. And it's about karate. And then we bring a karate expert, a person of color into the schools and teach the children karate. So you're reading, then you're acting and learning what it is you just read and you're making connections. Same with chess, literacy and chess, where we read about a person who got in trouble a lot in school, but really loved chess, learned to play chess and now is a chess wizard or chess guru, whatever you want to call it, and they're learning to play chess. So that combination of activity and literacy really has made a difference. And we do that every summer, every winter break, every spring break. And it is without a doubt in the community, one of the most uh, sought after things. Something people don't know that my department does is we're responsible for minority women in business at, um, participation. So as Dr. Polio and the board are building all these schools throughout the district, this department has to make sure that some of the people that are helping to build those schools, some of those companies are women, are black or are minority. There's no reason to build a school in the West End and all you see is white contractors there. Because then again, that also makes a statement. So minority women in business is a part of our work. Uh, my, some of my team that is on here, we have something called the Equity Monitoring Progress Tool where the schools have to present artifacts that show that they are being um, equitable and how they are moving that work forward. Same team has a, um, not a program, but a tool called the Affirming Racial Equity Tool, where that tool is um, laid next to a lesson plan to make sure you are affirming racial equity. Uh, something that I'm sure they do not know, and this was um, Dr. Stark and Dr. Abdul Sharif's brainchild, Envision Equity is an education newsletter that last I checked is probably the most educate, most, um, read education periodical in the Midwest as mm -hmm. relates to education. Mm -hmm. And that comes from one person, Dr. Abdul Sharif, and we highlight people that are doing racial equity work throughout the community, I mean, throughout the district, um, and uh, we highlight them. Mm -hmm. uh, last thing I'll say, because there is uh, so, so much, we have an equity screener. The equity screener says, if you raise your hand and say you want to uh, lead a school in JCPS, you need to show that in the position you're already in, you're about that racial equity work. So you have to apply and qualify yourself as saying, I've been doing this work. No longer are we saying, well, we can hire you, Patricia, even though you haven't done this work and hope you get to do it. You have to present yourself in a position that says you have already been doing this work and are really too ready to exacerbate it in a great way and move it forward. Um, I really, really, really hope that uh, you all can check out the curriculum Vita because there's so much this department is doing. I'm the loud mouth that does a lot of the talking, but I literally have people that are doing the walking, jogging, wrestling, and fighting that are really, really making a, a difference. And Dr. Stark was one, but she had to move on to bigger and better. But um, Dr. Stark helped move a lot of this work as well. You know, and still committed to the work because again, it's, um, uh, it's if not us, then who? You know, right. and uh, we need our hands on deck you know, and I commend you all for the work that to continue to do, you know, every day. Um, and um, a, a question right now, there's a lot of conversation in our community 
um, surrounding the new schools and student assignment and now the new school schedules, you know, how does um, DEP is involved in that? How does, uh, how, what role do you all play in that? Because there's a lot of conversation surrounding all of that and people just want to know, you know, what to do, how to navigate, what's going on. So what is the role in DEP? And uh, we have you know, new, uh, schools, um, some new schools that's going to be built. And uh, we just, some of them have just been named. And then we have uh, the school schedules that's still under conversation right now. Right. So the bell schedule working backwards has not been approved, but it um, changes in when certain school, when schools start, um, different start times. Um, the superintendent, the cabinet, which I am on, and the board have to, well, the superintendent and cabinet believe that there must be a change in the start times. Not, I mean, we talk a lot about bus shortages, but we also understand that access to school and starting different times is scientifically proven to be better. Um, so there's that that's in the, in, in the making. But here's what the chief equity officer must do. Start times or not, whether we change them, and I think we should, What's happening when they get to the schoolhouse is just as important. So you don't hear a lot about start times will improve achievement because that's, I mean, it, to some degree it might, but the only thing that improves achievement is teachers teaching to achieve. So regardless of when we change these start times, again, I'm saying it must happen because of our bus shortage, because science has shown that certain kids uh, age-wise can get there early or should get there early and other things. And also I wanna be clear too, a lot of urban districts did this 10, 15, 20 years ago. Here we are with two start times that again, um, hopefully my grandkids don't have to, but I only had two start times ever in JCPS. So that's one part. Uh, all the new schools being erected and put up. Great, need to do it because I believe image is a big part of uh, the whole thing, but image is not everything. But again, a Porsche without an engine is really not a Porsche, it's just a model car. Once we make the Taj Mahal building, we need Taj Mahal teachers. Mm -hmm. So as we say we're going to be equitable and put all this stuff in the West End, in Newburgh, in the East End, in the South End, beautiful, great, much needed. You should not have a school that looks beat up and ran down in a neighborhood that's been beat up and ran over for decades. That school needs to be pristine. But the pedagogy and the teaching inside that school must be as um, pristine, progressive, and uh, correct as possible. So our job is, and I tell my team this all the time, we're going to support all of this because we believe it needs to happen. But at the end of the day, I'm about that schoolhouse. And we're going to stay, I'm sorry, and we're going to stay about that schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we are with that. Again, believe that we should be erecting schools all the time. Last school put in the West End, I think was some bajillion years ago. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do to change that? And how are we going to change that is kind of where we are. Mm -hmm. What was the other part of that question? And Geneva, keep talking. I'm about to plug this in because it's about okay. to die. Keep, keep well, and, and one of the things that you stated was just so profound is that it's not just the building, but what's happening inside the building. You know, and it's, yes, it's good to have buildings, but also what was more, I guess, disturbing that's been brought, when you have kids that's missing an hour and a half every day to two hours because of bus shortages, you know, that is a, um, um, it, that's sinful, you know, when you have students yeah. that's getting to, that's missing that type of instruction every day, then the, the charge becomes, they have to do something, you know, because they were talking about the number of minutes that students were missing. But even like I said, just recently, I found out that, you know, kids were missing two hours a day, they were late for instruction, you know, and that's, some, that's time that they can't make up. And we're talking about coming from, a pandemic, we're still suffering from that, where again, before the pandemic, we knew that there was a problem. And then during the pandemic, or when coming back, returning, students have to learn how to do school. But then right. now we're talking about being two hours late. How do we, you know, just, um, you know, it's almost like you have to do something, you know, and I know there's a lot of concern and people speaking about schedules, but even to hear, like you said, that this has been going on in other districts for 10, 15 years. Right. And, and that, that's something that I, I uh, commend the superintendent and this board on for making certain changes. And I'm sorry that the um, mm -hmm. uh, shade is kind of making me look uh, <laughs> different, but um, <laughs> it is, it's very important that we make these changes because um, sitting where we are, we're gonna continue to get what we have to get. 
Uh, and I, I love the way you teed that up. The pandemic of COVID has, uh, is going to be a problem and it's going to last. But I'm fearful that the curriculum of America has taught us to just say, well, that's always going to be here. We're going to, we can vaccinate the hell out of COVID. And if we wanted to, you know, make sure that no one else gets super duper sick around it. Mm -hmm. But until we get a vaccination for ignorance, until we get a vaccination for racism and sexism and ableism, mm -hmm. um, that's not, that's not something that a needle can do. That's the schoolhouse's job. Yes. Right. So as we talk about COVID's going to be here and we got to bounce back from COVID, well, there were other pandemics going on well before COVID that we ain't fixed. The pandemic of racism being one of the main ones. Um, so how are we going to make sure as all these pandemics keep coming, the quintessential pandemic and the main pandemic in America has not been vaccinated. And that is the schoolhouse, part of the schoolhouse's job and the rest of the American curriculum to do so. And, and, and you're absolutely right, because as I share with individuals, we're dealing with about 20 different pandemics right now. You know, right. and, 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 and it's real. So not just with COVID, but also the racism and social justice, educational disparities, economic disparities, and insurrection, police brutality, mass shootings, and you know, mass exit of educators. And we're dealing with a number of different pandemics right now. And it's a heavy lift, it's a heavy burden, but we also need to be mindful. How do we take care of our mental and physical health in the process of all of that? Because again, we're dealing with about 20 different pandemics. We had an insurrection of people saying it was just a visit to the, to the White House. You know? So we're dealing with multiple pandemics. Absolutely. And for the mental health of individuals, what do you say to those individuals? How do they grasp the, the mental, or what are we doing to address the mental health, not only just with students, but also with adults as well? Yes, so, um, it's, and it's funny you say that because I'm a big believer in mental health and um, I make sure I stay on point with my, with my therapist. But we also need to understand when we start talking about mental health, that there is a reason why people are mentally ill. There is something going on in society that is making us mentally ill. So taking that to the schoolhouse and this board and all the boards throughout the country dropping 20 million, 50 million, $30 million on the mental health of students is gladiatorial and commendable. But unless we address the mentality of America that makes us mentally ill, we're actually just making kids learn how to cope. Mm -hmm. So the mental health problems that we have are without a doubt earned and can be pinpointed. But are we pinpointing the cause of the mental health? Or are we just helping John and Geneva and Lamanda and anyone else um, deal with the mental health? Mm -hmm. What we need to be trying to do is eradicate the causes of mental health if we're going to end mental health. Helping John get through watching black men get lynched, watching women get um, disproportionate uh, salaries, watching um, uh, students um, not be able to access in um, their curriculum the way they want is a part of mental health as well. Um, so as we continue to give money and as we continue to put resources in school to address mental health, again, I am a purist when it comes to the schoolhouse. We must address the mentality that is making students ill. The mentality of a country that has so much mental health cannot just be fixed by meeting with a mental health counselor unless we fix the system that's causing. Because sometimes teachers don't realize they're contributing to mental health. Parents don't realize that they're making their daughters crazy, but the system hasn't taught us how to address them. So that's what we have to be very careful of when we start talking about mental health. Also, it can be an escape goal. Well, I can't teach John because he has so many mental health issues. Actually, I could argue, well, if you teach him, some of the mental health issues will go away. Right. Right. I mean, and, and you're absolutely right, you know, because we have to be strategic and intentional with the work because it's um uh, it's there. And also we looking at um young people screaming for help. That's what I see it, you know, right. and they say, where are the adults? Who's fighting for us? Because there's a direct correlation of what's happening in our communities, what's happening in our schools. You know, but how do we address that? You know, and you know, every day is when we see things like, oh my God, don't tell me that's is happening again. You know, and um, as I'm doing the work with um, with Mayor Francis Winter, a book called Black Fatigue, and it yeah. indicates that people are um, sick and tired of being sick and tired, and that how it becomes a part of your DNA. You know, it becomes mm -hmm. intergenerational because of this and the way it happens, and we're in a situation that 
in the crossroads that every day it's, it's something else. We've had 79 mass shootings and we have not had 79 days in the school year right? or in the calendar year, but we've mm -hmm. had 79 mass shootings. Mm -hmm. And, and, that, and that, that is, again, that is an American curriculum that we must address, right? Mm -hmm. Like that is a part of what's going on that um, we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. The shootings, damning and disgusting and horrible mm -hmm. and unnecessary. Mm -hmm. But how does an American curriculum manifest itself mm -hmm. to keep having them? Mm -hmm. What is it about guns and violence and gunpowder and, and hate? That has actually exacerbated these people to go in to do uh, to do these mass shootings, and that reminds me of something. It's connected, but not connected. I want to make sure we understand what happened in Memphis. Let me tell you something that's happened to chief equity officers. Dr. Marshall, can we stop talking about disproportionality and how black people are being mistreated in their own communities? Because it was black cops that killed the black man in Memphis. I want to be very clear: you can be of color and uphold white supremacy. I don't think black people can be racist, but black people can definitely uphold supremacy. Why? Because you are in a system that already did that. So if you're an AP and are fine suspending John in Geneva and all the black kids from the West End and the system allows you to do that, you are upholding supremacy. If you're a teacher and are just going to stick to Huck Finn and how great Thomas Jefferson is and uh, black people started on the world stage at slavery, you are upholding supremacy. If you are a principal and you do not have the nerve to actually deal with racial equity, you are upholding supremacy. So you can be of color and uphold supremacy, which in turn upholds a system that has never been designed for us. What we need to do is not uphold supremacy, black, white, or green. That goes back to the cowards, that goes back to those that don't know anything, and that goes back to those that know exactly what they're doing. Well, um, right now, and of course, um, you and I, we can talk all day long about this because we're very passionate about the work, but it's now 4.57, you know, and uh, we're going to end at 5. That's so cool, right? yeah, That was fast. I, I know, <laughs> you know, but um, hey, um, good work and good conversation. And also for the audience who, who can take away some things with this. And so um, parting words, um, Dr. John Marshall, um, Chief Equity Officer, and again, um, have the highest respect for you because again, um, as I and we travel across the country, Jefferson County Public Schools, with all this, you know, set of problems, we're you know, we're leading the pack, you know, in this work, you know, and unapologetically. And some right. school systems they can't even talk about um racial equity. They can't speak about what's going on. So I have to commend you all for the for the work that's being done and, and the leadership um, that you um and just the innovation and the desire to to go the extra mile and to be innovative and to, to push the limits, you know? So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, my parting words would be, and maybe it's more of a question. I'm working on a piece, um, it's titled, I think Sam Cook might've lied. I want y'all to think about, is a change really coming? Mm -hmm. Is a change actually coming? Mm -hmm. He believed it, um, but I just don't know if we have the bandwidth, bravery, or nerve to actually make a change. And I don't know if there's enough people that want to because so many are benefiting from it. So my parting words is to listen to one of the greatest balladeers in the black world or in the world period, Mr. Sam Cooke and his social political song called A Change Gonna Come and see if Sam Cooke still, would still believe that now knowing everything that's going on. And what are you going to do? I guess my question, Dr. Stark is, what are you going to do to not make Sam Cooke a liar? What are you going to do to not um, uh, make to make sure that song is actually uh, truthful? Because right now, I'll tell you, I'm really starting to wonder if a change is going to come. If there's enough of us to even do it, so you want to give us a little a little note on that? You know, <laughs> no, I think someone else can. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, because as you say, Sam Cook, and I'm thinking about um, Harold Melvin, the Blue Notes. Wake up, everybody! No more sleeping right. in bed. No more backwards <laughs> thinking. Right. It's time to think in my head. You know. Um, but yeah. again, um, thank you. Um, well, I think we have maybe one question. Like we have a. And in that song, uh, the the singer said, "We need teachers to teach a new way." Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Would you mind sharing your racial equity analysis protocol? That's what someone asked. Uh, yeah. it, I don't, can my team put stuff in there or are they just yes, ignoring me today? Yes, they can. Or what we can do is that when we, um, because we send this back out and we can attach 
the racial equity analysis protocol to the um to the email that we send out thanking everyone sure. for being here but also for those individuals who can't attend then what we do is that we send uh, they have an opportunity to be able to view it you know in their space sure. so miss uh, we're just going to go to the web our website jcpsdep mm -hmm. uh type in actually if you just type in racial equity analysis protocol you can google it because there ain't too many of them it'll pop up that way too but either way i can make sure you all get it through dr stark or send it or however y'all wish to do it and uh, mr Octavia is from shelby county so um, okay. mm -hmm. um thank yeah, you y'all so need it too don't trip <laughs> maybe that's why she's asking for it but uh, again <laughs> um thank you dr marshall um for for your work um and your leadership thank you for your team you know for uh, because again um uh, it's about teamwork I mean um, and you have the right people in the right place to be able to do the work okay um okay um okay <laughs> she said yes you know but um again we'll do that and hey thank you and um we're going to leave you with that and um, enjoy the rest of your evening all right good night everyone okay